that I did what I did not for reasons of hate. I hated no one. I knew I was sick or evil or both. I should have stayed with God. I tried and failed and created a holocaust. Hey everyone, I'm Hill Harper. Jeffrey Dahmer is one of the most depraved and dangerous serial killers in recent memory. Not only because of the number of young men he killed, 17, and what he actually did to his victims, but because Jeffrey Dahmer was able to hide in plain sight for years, committing murder after murder after murder. He had everyone fooled, judges, police, friends, even his own family. You see, by the spring of 1991, 12 young men had gone missing. No one had connected the dots, not even the police. There was a serial killer on the loose in Milwaukee, and no one knew. This is how it really happened. Milwaukee Emergency Operator 71. Okay, hi, um, this is a young man. He has been beaten up. He is very bruised up. And he has no clothes on. He was really hurt. Where is he at? On the corner of 25th and State. A woman in an apartment building called police to say there's a young man running in the street without any clothes on. Concerned neighbors came around him and were offering assistance to him. At that time, he appeared to be confused and disoriented and basically looked uh, intoxicated. He's unconscious right now? Yeah, he getting him up, he's uh, he bruised up. Somebody must have jumped on him and stripped him or whatever. The neighbors are there, the police are there, and everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. And then suddenly, Dahmer arrives on the scene. He stated that uh, his roommate had been drinking and had uh, passed out on the couch of the apartment, and that uh, that's where he had left him when he had gone uh, to a local tavern uh, to obtain some beer or cigarettes. Dahmer convinced them that he and Conorak had a consensual and intimate relationship and that he would take him back to the apartment. Conorak uh, is a little drunk. Let me take it back up to my apartment. Everything will be fine. What no one knew at the time was that Dahmer had just met this kid. He offered him money to come back to his apartment with him. This kid had been drugged and was trying to escape his captor. Conorak, he was in a comatose state, and then he revived, left the apartment, and was outside naked. Dahmer's coming back literally from the liquor store with liquor and encounters the police with his victim. He uh, appeared to be a uh, calm. There was nothing to suggest that uh, uh, he was not as he was presenting himself to, to be. So the officers go up to the apartment and they don't see anything that gives them pause. They see Conorak's clothes folded over the side of the couch. They see an apartment that's not out of architectural digest, but it doesn't look like something untoward had been happening there. He manipulated those officers that night. The police see no reason to arrest Dahmer. They just say to him, take care of this kid, and then they leave. Immediately after the officers left, Dahmer killed Conrad. escort this boy to his death, essentially handing him over to Jeffrey Dahmer, who proceeds to kill him and dismember him. Connor Axintas Impone was just 14 years old, the youngest in a family of Laotian refugees. He's the boy who was spotted naked and bleeding, running from Jeffrey Dahmer. The investigation further discloses that the police department individuals who responded failed to conduct a basic proper police investigation into the matter. If the police would have only checked Jeffrey Dahmer's record, they would have found that he's a registered sex offender who was on probation for sexually assaulting a boy. And it's almost impossible to imagine, but that victim was the brother of Conorak. One of Conorak's older teenage brothers had been molested by Dahmer three years ago. So the, the whole thing was full of some very strange, like, what are the chance kind of coincidences. 
What police didn't know at this time? Jeffrey Dahmer was in the middle of a killing spree. If the police had gone into the next room, they would have found a dead body. Even as police officers talked to Dahmer in the living room, the body of his latest victim lay just a room away. He was so quiet, so reserved. You wouldn't have believed in a million years that he was a serial killer. Never would you believe it. Dahmer was a master manipulator. And he probably got that way because he knew he had thoughts that were just too dark to share. And he began to fantasize about what it would be like to have sex with men who were dead or unconscious. What Jeffrey Dahmer wanted was a man who looked good to him, which basically meant nice face, good biceps, good physique, who would accept him, not force him to do things he didn't want to do, allow him to lay with him all night long and not leave. Jeffrey Dahmer had sick fantasies of having sex with a dead or unconscious lover. But in the earlier years, he really tried to find alternatives to killing them. And the things he tried, he would scan obituaries for young males who had died, and he tried to dig up their graves, but the ground was frozen, so that didn't work. Another strategy he tried was to steal a mannequin from a department store by hiding out until after closing hours wanted to have it there with him as a substitute person. He tried every strategy he could devise to find a substitute for that voluntary partner who would lay there and not leave. Eventually, none of those strategies satisfied him, so he began to target live victims. The next strategy he tried was to administer a sedative to men that he found attractive. Before Dahmer went out for the evening, he knew that he was going to be trying to find a victim. And he would prepare a drug uh, concoction of uh, benzodiazepines, Valium. He picked up victims at such a variety of places, you know, adult bookstores, the gay bars, on the streets. I mean, you, you, you know, you have to have a little bit of con man in you to do that. Dahmer would strike up a conversation with these men. How you doing? Talk to them a little bit. What he was trying to find out is if this was someone who would be missed. If someone said, I haven't spoken with my family in years, that was the kind of person he was looking for. And when we brought a victim back, he would offer the individual the drink, and that would sedate them, and then he was able to take control of them. And then do what he wished with them, and they were completely under his control. They couldn't resist. They couldn't say, no, I don't like this or don't want that. So it was his desire to dominate, to completely dominate. This was Dahmer's M.O. for years, picking men up and drugging them. But in 1987, the M.O. changed. He lured a man to his hotel room. Dahmer met him in Milwaukee. He took him to the Ambassador Hotel. They had sex. Dahmer says that he blacked out. And when he woke up in the morning, he woke up next to Stephen Toomey's dead body. Later, Jeffrey Dahmer talked about that night with Stone Phillips on Dateline NBC. He was hanging over the side of the bed and uh, I have no memory of beating him to death, but I must have. And that's when it, when it all started again. And once it started again, you found it impossible to stop. Right, that, that's when the, the obsession went into full swing. After he got a taste of it, that's when he went out and started actively looking for victims, one after the other. He was very, very calculating. The way he picked out victims, the way he covered his tracks so that victims couldn't be linked to him, he, you know, he thought that out. This is a guy who'd been living a double life since he was a kid, 
trying to be normal on the outside, but holding secrets on the inside, as he told NBC's Dateline. Talking about it, I don't think would have made that much difference. Because like I said, there were things going on in my head that uh, I would have never opened up and talked about with anybody. He had developed a fascination fairly early with the idea of skeletons and dissection. It's pretty frightening that he was thinking that way way back then, and the rest of us had no clue. Tonight exclusive, the parents of Jeffrey Dahmer. Their son was one of America's most notorious serial killers. Now, in an exclusive interview, his parents, Lionel and Sherry Dama, speak out on what went wrong to turn their handsome, soft-spoken son into a monster. Why are you coming on? I really want to uh, tell parents about what I think they should look for in rearing their children. You can uh, help a lot of people. Yeah. And you support that, Sherry? Uh, absolutely. Anything that we could do to uh, circumvent or prevent another Jeff would be a blessing. Because it can't be easy. It is not easy. It would easy. be easier to forget about it. <laughs> Absolutely, can, right? but no one allows us to forget about it. What was he like as a teenager? He had a small circle of friends uh, who liked to uh, play gags and joke around a lot. Practical jokes? Yeah. In high school, Jeff Dahmer sort of became attached to my group of friends. We sort of adopted him, you could say. We found him an interesting guy because of his sense of humor. I remember him running down the hall and yelling, tornado, 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 get down on the floor, everybody get down on the floor. And then just walking down the hall calmly after that. We thought things like that were really funny that he did. One of my best friends from high school is John Backdorf, and he wrote a book called My Friend Dahmer, a graphic novel. And that book basically shows our high school days at Revere High better than anything else, better than anything I can tell you. What his high school friends didn't know, and what his family didn't even know, was that Jeffrey Dahmer wasn't what he seemed to be. He was hiding something. He had developed a fascination fairly early with the idea of skeletons and dissection. At the age of 12 to 14, we found out that he had been collecting dead animals, roadkill, riding around the rural roads and collecting them in bags. He would take them home and he'd cut them up, and the colors fascinated him. The colors of the internal organs of the other dead animals uh, got them all excited. And he had the additional problem that he was growing up in Ohio, discovering he was gay at a time when this was very repressed and not something that he could come out freely about. In the book, My Friend Dahmer, it really lays out the struggles that Jeffrey Dahmer had in high school struggles to fit in, the struggles that he had fighting off those twisted fantasies. And he tried to explain his bizarre behavior when he did an interview with Dateline NBC. I think it was around <clears throat> age 14 or 15. Started have, having obsessive uh, thoughts of, of violence uh, intermingled with sex. The rest of us had no clue that he was thinking about killing someone or having sex with someone or their body at that age. Well, what we learned many years later was that Jeff Dahmer had an obsession with a jogger that ran by his house. What nobody knew at the time, including the jogger, was that Jeffrey Dahmer was having fantasies about abducting him. He was planning to hit the jogger over the head with a heavy object, drag him into the bushes, and have his way with him. He had hidden in shrubbery, hoping to attack him and prepared to attack him, but he never got the nerve. That was pretty frightening to realize that we were around him when his mind had these visions going on in it. 
Jeffrey Dahmer knew that his sexual urges were sick, they were twisted, but he couldn't tell anybody. His solution was alcohol. He was drinking in the parking lot before school. He was drinking out of booze in his briefcase that he carried around, which was sort of weird. When Jeffrey was in his senior year, his parents' marriage was really falling apart, and his dad ended up moving out. How did Jeff take it? Jeff, I think he had to he told me that, that it disturbed him very much. Senior year, he drifted away from us. I think that his academic record started to fall apart, and he stopped going to a lot of classes at the end of our junior year, senior year. I think Jeffrey Dahmer really lost it when his parents divorced and his mother took off with their younger son and moved somewhere else and left Jeffrey Dahmer alone in the family home. Later, Dahmer explained it in his confession. He states that it was at this time he started to have strong feelings of being left all alone and strong desires of not wanting to have people leave him. That not leaving him was an important issue to him. Being abandoned in the family home while dad's gone and mother leaves with the younger brother to start a new life, that's the moment he broke, he snapped, the world became a dark and awful place, and everybody was his enemy. Shortly after his graduation, Jeffrey Dahmer was driving around and passed Stephen Hicks. And something told him to turn back around, and he did. Stephen Hicks was on his way to a rock concert that night, and Stephen Hicks never made it to that rock concert. Dahmer took Stephen Hicks back to his parents' empty place, and they were drinking beers together, and that's when something went horrifically wrong. There was an altercation because Stephen wanted to leave. Jeff had made a pass at him, and Stephen wanted to leave. Dahmer took a barbell and banged him over the head with it. And this was his first encounter with how much work it is to dispose of a human corpse. Police say Hicks was a hitchhiker picked up by Dahmer when he was just 18. The victim killed in a bedroom, his body dismembered in a tight crawl space. He killed Stephen Hicks, he cut him into pieces, he put him into garbage bags. This is where it all could have ended. Dahmer was on the way to the dump with Hicks's body and he suddenly pulled over by police. You know, he was stopping for a violation. You know, he, he wasn't drunk, so they let him go. Incredible. Here, he first time he kills a human being, he, and the cops pull him over, and they say he wasn't nervous. What were you doing? I'm taking garbage to the dump. He was as cool as cool could be. That was a close call for Dahmer and a missed opportunity for society. Mike Kukrell remembers giving Dahmer a ride home about that time and dropping him off right in the driveway of his parents' empty home. What I did not know at that time, there would be no way to know it, was that when I gave Jeff Dahmer a ride home that night, there was probably a body in his house, the body of Stephen Hicks that he had killed. I never thought that would be the last time I'd see him. Just a couple of weeks after high school, Jeffrey Dahmer had already killed his first victim. Uh, he was pretty aimless, didn't know what he wanted to do, and it was actually his dad that pushed him to go to college. He did go to Ohio State for one semester or one quarter in the fall, that fall, and all he did was drink and not go to classes, and that was the end of that. He came back home, and I then proceeded to take him to the Army. He served. He came back from boot camp looking like a, just a, a wonderful physical specimen. Uh, we were encouraged. Less than three years after joining the Army, Dahmer was kicked out for excessive drinking. What happens after the Army? He kept getting into trouble. Eventually, it got so bad that we, we sent him to his grandmother's house in New Wisconsin. Parents. That's when he came under grandmother's influence and kind of straightened out his lifestyle. She had him going to church, and he abstained from many of these activities. For a while, it went very well. My mother cooked for him, and he finally found a job at, uh, at a chocolate company. But then 
things started to occur. His drinking accelerated and the killing accelerated. It was only a matter of time before Dahmer would trip up. Jeffrey Dahmer had already killed five young men by the time his grandmother threw him out in 1990. He moved into his own apartment in the seedy neighborhood of Milwaukee. And that's when things really started to spin out of control. No longer accountable to anyone, Dahmer was now free to give in to his most twisted, sadistic fantasies, like some horror movie come to life. Dahmer was one of the few Caucasian people that lived in that neighborhood. And he moved into an apartment building where it was almost all uh, African Americans. And when he moved into apartment 213, nobody knew what was happening behind that door. Jeffrey Dahmer's crimes were escalating. His dismemberment rituals were getting more and more grotesque, if that's even possible. He laid down plastic and uh, was preparing to dismember the body, but he hated doing so so much that he had to get drunk to overcome his aversion to it. Dahmer hated disposing of his victims, and he came up with an idea that was more horrific than anything he had already done. It was a way to keep his would-be victims alive. My brother was Errol Lindsay. He was 19 years old. He left home going to get a key made, and he just never came back. He never came back. Errol Lindsay was Dahmer's first experiment. Errol was just like the normal kid trying to hustle up, you know, on money, however he could get it, you know. He met this individual approximately in March of 91 on the corner of 27th and Kilbourne. He offered this individual money for posing and to view videos. Earl was not gay, you know, and if he was gay, I, you know, he was still my brother and I still would love him, but he wasn't gay. I don't know what it took to get him to his house. What Jeffrey did to Errol Lindsay was so beyond the pale. I mean, you really can't write this stuff. He started drilling holes in the skulls of people who are alive. Dahmer talked about this period in an interview with Inside Edition. I tried to uh, keep the person alive by inducing a zombie-like state. Um, by uh, injecting uh, first a dilute acid solution into their brain or uh, hot water. In his mind, he was trying to create a kind of a zombie, someone in a zombie state. He wanted these people to stay with him. He didn't want them to leave, and he didn't really want them to die. My brother was not an angel, I know that, but he didn't deserve to, to die the way that he did. After Errol Lindsay was killed, Dahmer killed six more people in the span of about three months. Dahmer talked about the end of his killing spree on an interview with Dateline NBC. The killing was just a means to an end. That, that was the least set, uh, satisfactory part. I didn't enjoy doing that. Mm -hmm. That's why I tried to uh, create uh, living zombies with uh, uretic acid in the, in the drill. Late in his killing spree, he was in an uncontrolled drinking binge that made him fall behind in his schedule of disposing of bodies. He would often call in sick that Monday uh, because he would be working on disposing of the bodies. And, and if you looked at the early timeline, he always spaced it out. He would never bring another victim in until other victim had been disposed of, if you will. His drinking accelerated and the killing accelerated. It was only a matter of time before Dahmer would trip up. He just became very desperate and 
there was less planning as, as it went on. After killing 17 victims over 13 years, Jeffrey Dahmer met a guy named Tracy Edwards. Dahmer had picked him up, persuaded him to come to his home. Edwards decided he was in danger and wanted to get out of there. Dahmer had gotten a handcuff on. He handcuffed the guy with one cuff, and then there was sort of this elaborate negotiation where the guy said he had to go to the bathroom. Tracy Edwards would have been number 18. I knew something was about to happen, so I suggested that I go to the bathroom. I just seized the opportunity. I said, well, at least I'm going to die trying. I'm not just going to sit here, you know. Well, what'd you do, son? Uh, I hit him, I, and I ran towards the door, and he, like, was right there, tried to grab me, get me back in there. He races to the cops, and he says, get this handcuff off me. I told the policeman that this freak, this crazy guy, was trying to hurt me. Their key wouldn't fit. So they, so they went back to Dahmer's apartment to get the key to let get the handcuff off. On the way, on the way, Edwards told him, by the way, he wouldn't let me look in the refrigerator for some reason. Dahmer was there. He had been, he was drunk. He opened the doors, says, come on in. Dahmer lets him in, unlock this thing, and the cop walks over and looks in the refrigerator, and there's a fully in flesh skull. When police showed up at Jeffrey Dahmer's apartment to check out Tracy Edwards' story, they walked into a human slaughterhouse. There were uh, whole heads in the refrigerator, and there were fillets of biceps in the freezer. It's kind of clear the jig was up when you're found with so much in your apartment. Um, and there's really no way out. There was a large silver stainless steel cooking pot, and at the bottom of that cooking pot were two severed hands. There were binders of Polaroid photographs that basically depicted individuals before and after death. The pictures were horrific. It was like someone setting stage with mannequins but these aren't mannequins, these are human beings. Imagine these police officers standing there and trying to take this in, trying to process what was going on. There was no crime scene ever like this for the people that responded that night. The types of uh, revulsion that one feels when you, when you witness something like this firsthand cannot be described. Back in 1991, you show up at a crime scene. People have the boom boxes out, they're yelling. This was eerie in how quiet it was. Especially when the barrels started coming down the stairs. In the corner was this large 50 gallon plastic container. And it turned out that there were four intact skeletons in that container. And at that time, we made the decision that we would uh, contact a hazmat unit to transport that container. The actual uh, crime scene investigation was more like dismantling a museum rather than uh, an actual crime scene. So the police arrest Jeffrey Dahmer just before midnight. And by 1.30, he's at the Milwaukee Police Department talking and talking and talking like he had never talked before. I think he wanted to talk to us so much was because he never had someone to sit down and actually relate to. And during that questioning, we got a semblance of who was killed at what time and when and the order they were killed. Over the next six weeks, Jeffrey Dahmer spent 166 hours confessing in graphic detail to all the murders he'd ever committed and all the sick things he'd ever engaged in, including cannibalism. He got the nickname the Milwaukee Cannibal, but that was a small part of his MO and of his desires. 
and was a late arriving part and really sprang from his thought that it was such a waste to have brief time with these men and then for them to disappear. And the idea of eating a part of them was the idea of incorporating a part of them into himself. And we had secretaries that were typing our reports that couldn't type them. They couldn't take it, so they had to see a psychiatrist about it. Jeffrey Dahmer, the man officially charged in four murders in Milwaukee, but at the center of nearly a dozen others, confessed to more killings Monday. And by the July 24th, we had a full confession for 17 murders. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we now begin an odyssey. The details are grisly and graphic and sickening. Jeffrey Dahmer's odyssey of sex, murder, and cannibalism is unfolding in a Milwaukee courtroom. In this case, his plea was not guilty by reason of insanity. So the only issue was, was he sane when he did it? The foundation of an insanity defense is, does the defendant know right from wrong? And clearly in this case, Jeffrey Dahmer did know right from wrong because A, he elaborately planned these crimes, and B, he elaborately covered them up. Cold-blooded planning for sexual satisfaction. Your life for my sexual satisfaction. I uh, pointed out how carefully everything had been planned. He was not a man out of control. Uh, the manifestations of a, a homicidal maniac he did not show. I tried to persuade them that somewhere along the line, he got to the point where he was unable to control his conduct. He was a runaway train on a track of madness. There was a locomotive engineer running the train. It wasn't out of control, and the engineer was Dahmer. To show that Jeffrey Dahmer was mentally ill and out of control, his defense attorney puts Tracy Edwards on the stand. Tracy Edwards lived to tell about it and tell he did in court Friday, describing how Jeffrey Dahmer underwent an almost physical transformation from nice guy to would-be killer. Now, when you got to his apartment, how was he acting? Just like a normal, everyday person, you know, friendly. This guy is so nice, and all of a sudden, you know, it's like he was pulling knives and handcuffs and all on me. Where was the knife pointed? When I was on the floor, he had it pointed at my groin area at that time. And then he was telling he didn't want people to leave him or abandon him. His face structure seemed different, you know, his body structure is like it wasn't him anymore, you know? It's like it was a totally different guy here. He kind of laid across me, put his head across my chest at that point. What was he doing with his head? Like he was listening to my heart, because at a point he told me he was going to eat my heart at that point. I just sat stunned and motionless, listening to all these things. But inside, I was practically losing my cookies. The whole trial took less than three weeks. And as is customary, he got a chance to address his victims. And his victims' family members got a chance to let him know how they felt, too. That's why I hate you! I hate you! In regard to the death of Richard Guerrero, did the defendant, Jeffrey L. Dahmer, have a mental disease. The families were very emotional. This was three weeks of hearing the most awful information about how your loved one died that most of us can't even imagine it. And now the, the end is coming. Did the defendant, Jeffrey L. Dahmer, have a mental disease? Answer, no. Jeffrey Dahmer's three-week sanity trial came to an end this afternoon. Most of the jurors rejected the defense claim that Dahmer was a sick man. In regard to the death of James E. Dockstader... When the judge was reading 
the decision by the jury. He went through every victim's name and then said the decision. In regard to the death of Anthony Sears, the families would just weep. I was there. I was sitting in with the rest of the families, and I think we all were in shock that day. And then came the victim impact statements. You took my 17-year-old son away from me. I'll never get a chance to tell him that I loved him, and for that, I can never forgive you. I hope you... I hope you can deal with what you've done. Dahmer didn't look at the, the people. He looked straight ahead the whole time. I'm mad. This is how you act when you are out of control. For the most part, the family members who gave their victims impact statements maintained their composure. But then one of the sisters of Errol Lindsay let loose. I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you. This is out of control. My sister, I guess she just wanted to let him know how she felt, you know, to see the hurt on my mom's face every day. I don't know, she just, she lost it. She just lost it. So after the families gave their gut-wrenching victim impact statements, Jeffrey Dahmer addressed the court. I know society will never be able to forgive me. I know the families of the victims will never be able to forgive me for what I have done. I have seen their tears, and if I could give my life right now to bring their loved ones back, I would do it. I am so very sorry. He was just a person who had descended into another world and had no emotion left and no empathy or sympathy for anyone else. He had gone through a lot of big changes and was just far off the deep end. I know my time in prison will be terrible, but I deserve whatever I get because of what I have done. I didn't ever want freedom. Frankly, I wanted death for myself. Jeffrey Dahmer stood up today in Milwaukee County Court and asked for the maximum, and he got it. 15 consecutive life sentences, no parole, for 936 years. Dahmer went to prison in, in 91. He went to the Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage, Wisconsin. It's a maximum security prison. In prison, Dahmer found God. He even got baptized. No one really heard about him for nearly three years, but that all changed one day in 1994. Jeffrey Dahmer was himself attacked and killed this morning as he and another inmate were cleaning a prison toilet. Dahmer was arguably the most high-risk prisoner at the institution, and another inmate Jesse Anderson were together cleaning a bathroom. Christopher Scarver, who was an inmate who was there for murder, grabbed a barbell from the gym, went into the bathroom, and beat both Jeffrey Dahmer and Jesse Anderson to death. Preliminary findings of the pathologist were that Mr. Dahmer died as a result of blunt force injury of head. Jeffrey Dahmer was beaten so badly that not even the people treating him knew who he was until after he was pronounced dead. Reactions to Dahmer's death were what you would expect, of course. Families of his victims were relieved that the nightmare was over. It shows today that he paid for what he had did to these children out here. I don't feel anything. I'm numb right now. I looked at him with a lot of hate in my heart. I really hated him. I hated that man. I hated him for what he did to our family. My family has never been the same behind that. Never been the same. In closing, I just want to say that I hope God has forgiven me. I know society will never be able to forgive me. This was a case to tell the world that I did what I did not for reasons of hate. I hated no one. I knew I was sick or evil or both. Jeffrey Dahmer's defense attorney hoped his client would be found insane. That would have landed him in a psychiatric hospital where doctors could have studied his urge to kill. No one ever got to study Dahmer's brain. A judge ruled against preserving it after his death and it was ultimately destroyed. We'll never know what drove Jeffrey Dahmer to kill. But even if we did, 
it would have been too late for 17 families who lost their loved ones. I'm Hill Harper. We'll see you next time on How It Really Happened.